Storygram Network. Hello, we are the Sonoma Community Center podcast, a place of creativity, connection, and community. We highlight the artists, teachers, and the community that come through the doors of our historic brick building, often called the heart of Sonoma. We share local tips and shout outs to our home, Sonoma Valley. And we are your hosts, Molly Spencer. Gerardo Diaz. We are the engagement team of the Sonoma Community Center. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Sonoma Community Center podcast. I am Molly Spencer and filling in for Gerardo Diaz. This time we have our man who's usually behind the mic in front. Hey, how's it going? It's Takeshi sitting in for Gerardo doing color commentary. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know what Substitute we do. Substitute color commentary. I can already tell that we're probably not going to be talking deeply about food as much as Gerardo. Gerardo is out. I could fill in for him. Okay, we're filling in. <laughs> I just want to let him know that he is missing out if he's listening because we actually have a huge thing of pasole in the refrigerator right down in the kitchen. Wow. But anyway, we miss him. We can't wait till you're back, Gerardo. Takeshi, thanks for filling in. And today we have our new ceramics artist in residence, new to Sonoma, Dan, you know, I'm going to say it, Clausen. Oh, I know wow. it's not. You know, I get fancy <laughs> with it, right? You get fancy with it. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why for a second, because with my teenage daughter, we watch the Vampire Diaries, the originals, and everything else. And there's a character in there named Klaus. And <laughs> yes. we just recently did it. So... Pardon me. That's why I adapted your name to no, Klausen. That's perfect. <laughs> that is great. <laughs> Welcome, Dan. Thank you. So we're going to kind of deep dive over here at the community center. If you've listened to our past podcasts, we've had our ceramics artists in residence on in the past. Actually, last year, I think Raniel Del Rosario was our second guest only. We had Fred DeWitt in March, and that was an amazing, amazing, no pressure, amazing oh interview. But <laughs> you, you, it's always most intriguing. So it's the Sonoma Ceramics. Just a little update is we have Sonoma Ceramics Artists in Residency Program, and the residents come here, work on their materials, be it sculpture, be it pottery, you help run. You usually teach classes. I know you're teaching a class right now, right? Yeah, teaching. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then usually it ends in a show up in Gallery 212, which will be, I know this date right offhand, November 18th. Am I right? You are. Yeah. Uh, November yeah. 18th. Nice. So this is way ahead of time. Dan Clausen. <laughs> I'm just going to call you Dan. <laughs> That's totally good. Dan <laughs> is usually what happens. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dan. Welcome. We're excited. Show once again. And I want to give everybody kind of a visual reference if they're tuning in because a lot of this is visual arts. Where for now can they go and find your work and follow you? Are you, You're on Instagram. I am on Instagram. Uh, I think my handle, if you will, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm like, what's Instagram? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's at Daniel.Clausen. Do you have a website too? I do have a website and it's also danielclausen.com. Daniel Clausen. Wait, spell it real quick. It's uh, Daniel is D A N I E L and Clausen is C L A U S O N. That's right. Put in the U, folks. His microphone's going a little wonky on him. His, his microphone, Slowly. if you don't come to your microphone, it will come to you. It's definitely coming to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it. Dan, I'm so excited you're here. One of the things with Sonoma, well, especially the artists in residency, is they stay here all the time. There's an apartment upstairs. It's intriguing. Every time we have a new artist in residence, we're we're always finding out, hmm, what are they all about? It's it's just what's their style? And I was lucky enough to hear your artist talk about a month ago, which was really moving. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself, ceramics, your story, and we'll kind of go back from sort of little Dan yeah, and really where you are right now, but go ahead, share. Definitely. <laughs> um, no pressure. No yeah. pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. So I grew up in Seattle. 
And that really formed a lot of like what I make now and all of that. I'm very open about my identity. I'm queer. I'm also transgender. And I make a lot of art about that. So growing up trans is a very unique situation. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Definitely in America. But yeah, it's pretty subconsciously and directly involved that you grow up with the sense that you most likely will not like live a long life. Or if you do, you have to assimilate in many ways so that you can live in a society and be a part of that society because baseline, you really aren't a part of it. So I've always been making art. That was how I dealt with a lot of my own stuff. Yeah. (laughs) When you were really young. Yeah. And I know you have a brother, am I right? I do have a brother. Yeah, you have a brother. Growing up in Seattle, when did you kind of start identifying or kind of figuring out like, this this is not the regular norm and feeling different? Was it really young as a child? Yeah. I mean, I didn't really have to think much about... It, when I was really little because yeah. my family didn't have a ton of money and so everything was hand-me-down clothes. So I just wore what my brother wore and yeah. there was just no difference between us. And it wasn't until maybe like third grade when it was like, oh, people are changing and these roles are a lot more present. I do feel like that's around the time frame it starts... Yeah, I, mean, I teach really little ones, and I just don't see that totally. recognition. Yeah, of <laughs> you know gender yeah. identity, even Definitely. when I teach ballet, it's yeah. not really recognized until around third and fourth grade when they really start Definitely. putting it down yeah. different roads. You know, yeah, and I think it's also there's probably something with the brain there too, and like recognizing social norms and like being like oh I feel this way and then also kids are mean (laughs) well they will let you know if you are being weird quote unquote oh yeah so there's a lot I think about that year a lot because I feel like so much of it was like it wasn't the adults in my life really telling me what to do because my parents were fairly MIA so it was like really just learning from peers what was okay yeah Did you, like from a pretty young age, around third and fourth grade, really start experiencing, were you bullied in a way? I don't know. Kids are different. And and (laughs) were you like involved when you were really young? Have you always kind of been more leaning towards the art world? Did you do any sports or anything of that? Yeah, definitely. Um, Right? Yeah. So I always did art. And so that was just always like a baseline thing. I Did you start like drawing? Am I right? Yeah. When I was like really really young like way before third grade like my earliest memories are of just like taking anything in the house like pens pencils whatever I could mark with and then crawling under the furniture and then I would draw all over the furniture that's amazing <laughs> um until my mom found out but <laughs> yes did but you I draw on the walls too I did one of my brothers that was did a big that. no no <laughs> yeah <laughs> and definitely. he covered it up with the furniture <laughs> yep, I remember yep. he drew this really detailed almost like stick figures mm-hmm. kind of a scene, yes. right? On the wall. Yeah. And he covered it up. And I think he still kept adding to it. Absolutely. And, but which yes. was awesome. Yes. Looking back <laughs> on it, even if you're, you know, so I love that. Yeah. You know, there's creating a your own table. world, really. Yeah. There was like a short table we had uh, and I would always crawl under it. And I had this like really intense map. I had like made a map of like everywhere I had been wow. and I would add to it. And then... <laughs> Yeah, and then I'll never forget like my mom finding it and her being like, what the f***? <laughs> like, you Wait, can't just do that. <laughs> was this also like a map of, when I'm thinking a map, mm-hmm. it's like where you've been to or where did you want to go? But in your mind, you're like... It was been. where I had been. I Because oh, okay. where I grew up... In Seattle or kind of outside? It's like more suburbia north. Or, okay. There's a lot of woods. Kind of more rural area? And um, Seattle's an odd place. You know, place. I've never been up there. Really? <laughs> Have totally. you been up there, Takeshi? Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I know. Wow. Yeah. Giant. It's changing it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the space I grew up in, it's changed drastically. Like, uh-huh. I yeah. wouldn't even be able to recognize it anymore. But it used to be, like, a lot of, like, warehouses. It's where you'd buy, like, dirt and rocks okay. right. and lumber. So it was very, like, 
industrial, I guess. Or like Very building odd. material supplies. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I get that. A little yeah. Bit. I can see So it's that. a little, it's, it was a weird space because you're not really like suburbia, but you're not rural, but yeah. you're not in the city. You're just kind of in a spot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're just somewhere, you know. Uh-huh. Creating your own worlds. Yeah. I lived really close to this one state park and that was like absolutely like, the best part of my childhood. So spent like every waking hour, like in the woods really. I love that. And so I would like had this map of like what I could envision was my like surroundings. Um, But you know, who knows? It's (laughs) probably completely inaccurate. (laughs) Mm, I know. Isn't that funny? I grew up around that same age in South Carolina out and still the same kind of thing. Soybean fields everywhere, but really just, woods and gardens and we were like left to create we just like you get kicked outside and you don't come yep. in until it's dark right <laughs> so true. and yeah. i know right how lucky were we right? yeah. i mean there was like a pet cemetery back there but what i did is i was really into making these little paper dolls and i created my own like little world out there in the woods i had a lot of brothers right and we all had our own little forts i would say mine was like a roof fort that nobody could get to but <laughs> I think just having that opportunity to create your own world in the natural environment like that, I can't imagine anybody this day and age going, hey, go play in the woods for, I know, <laughs> you know, yeah. like tell it's your kids to different. go play in the woods for yeah. whatever. All There's day, like so. no screens or anything, you know, and exactly. you run to your friend's house and knock on their door and you're like, is so-and-so home? Can they yeah. play? <laughs> you know? And I definitely, that's something I deeply miss, like that kind of yeah. way of living, you know? Yeah, it's crazy that we're the last of that generation yeah. too. It's yeah. true. Yeah. It's true. I mean, unless you're in more maybe like a condensed area in the city or something, you're right up against each other. But anyway, we reminisce. <laughs> but we're going to keep on moving forward. I also know besides the park that was close to you, and I'm not going to lie, I really enjoyed listening to you on Kate Bruno's All About You show. Oh, yeah, yeah. She's a KSBY host, and I recommend everybody listen to the episode with you. I think it's in the archives. It's up there for about a month. It's up there for about a month? Yeah. <laughs> it's been like a couple of months. Huh? I know, better yeah. go pull it, it might be up there. <laughs> Maybe longer. You know, sometimes people on websites... <clears throat> <laughs> it takes a while to change things out. So <laughs> it's always a work in progress, the old website. So so anyway, I'll also note that you used to go down to the library. Yeah. Am I right? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And CDs were your era. Yes. Right? Because I'm tapes. So I'm a little bit older yeah, than yeah. you. So I was like, tapes. <laughs> I love that. And there's always a background of albums to catch you, right? <laughs> not that yeah. you're old, but not that you're album generation album. Yeah. <laughs> Right? Yeah, so CDs. No, CDs were huge. I had a select amount of friends, but not a lot. And so I spent quite a bit of time either with one friend or just by myself. Yeah. But yeah, I found out pretty young that like you could take the bus. And if you're under 12, you can take it for free. I also looked 12 until I was like 18. So, <laughs> I'm not going to lie, you don't look that I, much older than right, yeah. 18 I'm like, now. <laughs> maybe still go for free. <laughs> you know? We'll be bringing Dan in down for You could probably uh, get the discount, right? Yeah, the under 18 discount. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, could, I could swing that, you definitely. Could. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Hopefully good in the long run. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, I would uh, just take the bus and I found out where to get off uh, for the library and I went in and it was just like incredibly magical and all these books and I spent so much time reading but the CDs were huge and I remember just wanting to like listen to all of them and so I went to the front desk and I was like how many can I check out at one time uh, and they were like 50 and so <laughs> and so I would See, go that's and amazing because big- they were so expensive you were probably just getting into music at the time where cds were still oh, 25 dollars. Rainbow, least, yeah, right? oh, Rainbow yeah records i'd go and listen to all of the ones and then i would think which one do i really want you know yeah i mean i never i mean then, library was everything in my life yeah. like all the books all the cds but it still is like it's one of those way more super, hip though yeah, yeah i can't believe it yeah. Seriously, they have shows there sometimes. Yeah, yeah. The libraries of Sonoma County, I'm not going to lie, I get a little jealous when we're down there <laughs> at the farmer's market. We do yeah. outreach, right? And which is awesome. We get to 
do all kinds of activities. And then there's the library right next door. They're giving away <laughs> like, it hey, just have some really good, Jose Martinez, who mm-hmm. was a guest from a couple of weeks ago, has done a lot of programming and bilingual paint nights with them. Oh, nice. Yeah. So he just had the drag. Oh, yeah. Um, a series, basically, reading so drag great. things, which was controversial, but whatever. Come whatever. on, yes, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. Like, the library is such a deep resource. I used it to is. go there, too, and be able to get lost. And Yeah. I remember we were interviewing one of the librarians on the morning show, and she's like, oh, you play electronic music? You should come out and yeah. do a gig. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> it's a paying yeah. gig. Yes. Uh, yes. So yes. I was thinking, oh, maybe I should just, just do this whole entire circuit throughout Sonoma County <laughs> of library gigs. It is yeah. a library circuit. Yeah. yeah. There is a library circuit. There is. Oh. Yeah. Get some people that teach here as well. And they're all, well, summertime library circuit. <laughs> anyway, we let support your local library because look yes, what it support. does. It yes. like creates imaginative people. We yeah. have the same thing in South Carolina, like amazing two-story library with like yeah. a whole bug section. I just remember yeah. this rotating tray with what? all these bugs from around the world, you know, that they yeah. have. And yeah. same thing, just yeah, so museums cool. and libraries. Yeah. They're huge. <laughs> I know. Have to keep those alive, folks. Yeah. You know, it's like, really Because those were like two of my like main resources growing up. Like school is just so silly most of the time. <laughs> it felt like, like go to school kids, but you know, it's still like. Well, you know, that's a controversial subject in itself. I mean, not all of us were made for traditional learning. In right. fact, the majority of us are not. I yeah. had the same experience in high school where I didn't go. Went to a continuation, Agua Caliente, before it was Creekside, which is the local oh, continuation. Right. Yeah. It was called Agua Caliente Continuation yeah. High School. Hot Water High. And it was actually Hot where my daughter's high. school is, right? The Sonoma Charter yeah. School. And they did not encourage you to come back, right? They're all, you're never going to come back to the high school. You're not going to do it. And I'm all, yes, I will. Yeah. <laughs> kind of yeah. wish I had just moved on at that point, but I did come back, <laughs> you know, just to prove them wrong. Yeah. But it really holds dear to me of kids that don't fit the norm in a regular school situation. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was not really built for how I learn and operate. And also it's like, it's a rough space too, if you're not of a normal way. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Like I was pretty lucky, like the friends that I had growing up, I had a select little group and we were all just like the absolute feral children, like (laughs) the weirdos, you know, and I had a couple really deep best friends that, I mean, I like lived with one in high school and yeah, it was such an intense bond that I had with those people. But yeah, like one of my best friends, Hugo, first person I ever met that was trans. Uh, he came out to me really young. We were probably 14. Wow. And yeah. And I remember that being just really like revolutionary, but also like he was so intensely bullied. Uh, they had to drop out. That stuff's just like really yeah. real. I also feel like this is before... This is a while ago. I mean, you're Mm -hmm. in your mid twenties, right? Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. So it was just new. I mean, there's a lot of intense bullying around trans and the queer community, Yeah. which I know in California, it's it's a little bit better now or they're Mm -hmm. finding those safe spaces and resources for people to go to, but it's still out there. Yeah. (laughs) And you know that more than anyone. So glad that you found your kind of niche of people. Totally. That space at that yeah. Time I mean, it too. was life saving, but it, it's also deeply complicated too. You yeah. know, like the statistics with self harm and suicide with the trans community is like absolutely haunting. And that was not something that I managed to avoid with my small, close group. You know, like yeah. it was very visible with that group. And Seattle too has like a very intense depression. Is it mostly because of the weather too? That's always the question. And I definitely don't think it helps. Yeah. (laughs) Like it's 10 months of gray. Like the summers are gorgeous, like gorgeous summers. Thought about going up there in the early 90s. Yeah. This is definitely (laughs) pre-grunge right now, that time. Mm -hmm. And I've always had an issue. If you already are dealing with a little bit of, you know, that depression issues or manicness. And it also happens out at the coast. Yeah. Yeah. There's deep rooted need I find like a lot of people from the coast or from up north that still need that you know like it's it's just like this cleansing kind of feeling yet 
to be around at all time. <laughs> it's got to be balanced Absolutely. for some things, folks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, I'm really grateful I grew up there for certain reasons. Like, it's a beautiful place, but it, it also, like, absolutely haunts me. Like, yeah. it's one of those eerie spaces that doesn't really feel real when you grow up in it because it's, like, you do see a lot of, or at least where I was growing up and what I was exposed to is, like, pretty dark stuff. Yeah. There's also just a really intense heroin epidemic in Seattle and that was something that's never really gone away. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And like it was really and I mean it's probably always been intense but I remember that being a really present part of like my upbringing and it's so visible and it will like change you for sure. Right. It does. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I hate to say it there's always these drugs of choices, you know. Yeah. So Late 80s, it was definitely a lot of coke and that yeah. sort of thing. And then in my era, when we were all in our early 20s, that hit hard, the yeah. heroin epidemic. Yeah. It just takes its toll no yeah. matter what. It, I've had friends that li- have lived but not lived not, or yeah. are still living but not living. That's and a, now it's like a, a fentanyl one. speed world. And it's yeah. it's really hard. That is so present in everybody's lives, deeper in some communities than others. Yeah. Yeah. If they magically uh, die of a heart attack in their thirties, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 It, it's intense, and and it's yeah. really hard to go through it with friends. You know, yeah, oh my god, I don't, it, like cry for a second, but yeah. to just see them either go down that rabbit hole, and it, if you're not going with them, that's yeah. a really hard position to be in. You're losing Absolutely. like dear friends, and there's nothing you can do. Yeah. About it. So, and I just felt like it was extra intense in the small queer punk community because yeah. it was like those are your few people that you trust and have because you don't fit. And so it's like, how do you navigate seeing that also those bonds and such like also fall apart? It's like all mixed with so many things, but it's also not a um uncommon story at all. Like it's something yeah. I hear from so many other queer people. But since so often I feel like we just talk amongst ourselves, I like see the assumptions being made outside of my community about my community. And it's just like, it's just wild to me. The lack of information and the lack of exposure to what we experience and have to go through in order to survive. It's not just like a fun choice where we're like, oh yeah, like... I'm just yeah. feeling really gender fluid today. <laughs> <You know? Like. laughs> I mean, it's really deep rooted and yeah. let's kind of go on kind of into a next section. You're Absolutely. coming out of high school and where did you go from there? I mean, you're still experiencing what you're experiencing, Absolutely. you know, but like yeah. now you're. Uh, I was able to get a scholarship. I wasn't really sure if I was going to be able to go to college and then it kind of happened and that was really odd. <laughs> And, You're all, <laughs> wow, I <yeah>. get it. <laughs> yeah. But at that point too, I also was like the only thing that I've really figured out that I enjoy is art. So it was like really confusing on like, what do you do uh, in college? Because also in my brain, I was like, you don't go to college to do art. Like you, yeah. you go to college to be like a person. <laughs> Not that being an artist isn't, but it's, no, it's, you know, like. Instead of just yeah. the experience And finding, even though they say it's about finding what you really want to do. Yeah. It's not. The pressure to all this money has been put into it and you should be this productive person in society. You got to participate in our capitalist culture. (laughs) (laughs) But in high school, I like saved my money and bought myself a camera and I was really into taking pictures. So I was like, I'm going to go on this route of photojournalism because that makes sense. I also was fairly good at writing. So I was like, that also can, then maybe journalism is included in that. So then I was- Where did you go to school? Oh, University of Montana. I was there for a year and then I was just really lost and confused. It was also though the first time I took a clay class. So I entered being like, I'm going to be a photojournalist. Yeah. This is a path. I started interning for the newspaper on campus and- uh, hated it. Just was like, yeah. wow, this is like not it at <laughs> all. What was the environment like there for you as well? University of Montana. Did you find yeah. a group or was Missoula it compounded was by cool. a- Missoula? Yeah, that sounds like cool. I really, I felt really good there. It was complicated yeah. for sure. 
winters are really, really cold. There was definitely, I mean, freshmen, so there was definitely a heavy party culture. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I felt like I had a good group of people, felt fairly safe. I was like dating this girl for a little bit. And the only time that I ever felt like we faced anything super scary was like an old lady telling us to not hold hands. Okay. (laughs) But it was like, you know, that's typical. Um, Yeah, Missoula was pretty good, but I was also a very confused young person. Like we all are (laughs) and kind of should be to a point, you know, so we can explore. (laughs) Yeah. But at the end of that year, I had met someone else and he was moving back to where he was from. And I'd only known him like three weeks or something. And he was like, you want to move back with me? And I was like, well, I'm not, I don't have anything going on, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) And so I said, yeah. And so then I moved to Las Vegas and Uh, that was a big mistake. (laughs) That's its own culture right there. Especially if you're lost. Oh, not yeah. doing Young, too much of if you lost, can't find yourself confused. Yeah. 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 Then I was dating Vince and it was just very confusing and odd. And I like lost myself in so many ways. But yeah, I tried so hard to fit into like this greater American culture. Like that point in my life, I was just like, the only way I'm gonna be able to survive is if I can be a cis woman and get married and have children and like do this thing. Cause that's the only example I've shown of like a successful life, like just a life past 30. Cause yeah. at that point in my life, I had just like, I'd lost some friends and it was just so rough to see what pursuing your truth meant because to me that meant that you died. And so I yeah. was like, how can I keep there was living? This finality yeah. of, or how if do you I live for your who, friends? Yeah, that exactly. Passed away. Yeah. At what point did you find yourself? It was like when I was twenty-three. I hit like a pretty intense point of past like, Vegas, right? Yes, I had left Vegas at that point. Did you do it? Like, I feel like I imagine you in a car, <laughs> listening to maybe not your CD, maybe David Bowie drag- or something. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, the bow. Yeah, the we'll bow. have a Bowie segment. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> We're going to sidestep over to Bowie in a few yeah. because we yeah. all in three yeah, yeah. have yeah. this great no, thing. So intense, yeah. you're, yeah. So, you know, past Vegas. Yeah, past you're Vegas. You're ready to, you're like, okay. I did a lot of other things. I went to Italy. I, I oh, a, amazing. We're in Italy. Uh, it's this tiny town called Viterbo, but I had South a grant. Or north? It's in between Florence and Rome. Okay. So it's in like really beautiful. Florence. Yes, <laughs> Roma. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've been there, but it's yeah. super fun. I mean, yeah. there's a little bit of touch in yeah, like yeah. Sonoma, some similarities oh, as far it looks as environmental. Very, it's very yeah. similar. Exactly. Yeah, it's very well, strange. Sonoma is definitely built upon the Italians. This is an old, oh, yeah. everybody oh. that has property here, yeah. old school Italian families. And yeah. then on the other side, it's been all like over by the riverside where I live and stuff. The dirty west. <laughs> side that was all old summer homes because of the springs but it was a lot of immigrants coming up from san francisco wow a lot of the greeks and i still have a greek landlord (laughs) (sighs) intense yes so at 23 you had a spiritual awakening or yeah it was mostly like i was just so ill like i couldn't sleep i like couldn't eat i just felt this giant void it's like I knew. It's just like I like had forgotten for so long and tried to fill it in so many different ways. And then I don't know. It just like hit me where I was like, I just think this is like beyond a sexuality thing. Like I think this is something that goes back to like before third grade, you know. And yeah. I'm like, I always knew that like I didn't fit in this gender norm, but like, what does that mean? But yeah, then I came out as non-binary and then later was playing around with like, am I a trans man? Am I like trans? Am I non-binary? And kind of settled into this state of, I like the word trans, but everyone has different words around different things. I like it too. I think some beautiful words come out of that. Transformation. Yeah, exactly. Gender. It's like why I chose it. Yeah. I like that it's like, I'm going somewhere, but we don't know where. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so 23 hit and I 
figured my out. <laughs> and <laughs> this might be like personal, that. but did yeah. you start on the progress of hormones and surgery? Is that something that you would want to share? I can definitely share yeah. that stuff. Because yeah. I feel like it's important that a lot of people know yeah. some of that, of really the questions that they might not feel comfortable asking. Absolutely. What you really go through. It's insane. When you're taking all the hormones <laughs> and the surgeries, that's, that's a lot for your body. And I mean, it's honestly, it's like not a lot for the body. It's stuff that made the most sense in my body. Okay. And what was a lot was getting access to those things. That was the like really intense continuous trauma that I'm like going through of like just trying to stay on. So like for me personally, I am on testosterone and I've only been on it for a year and a half and it took me like two years to get it. Wow. And it's this kind of whole intense process. It depends on the state you live in, the insurance you have and your financial state. Cause also like if you have money, sure, the world's open to you. It is, but I understand just being in that yeah. medical, like you have to have insurance, but you're also under the state given health insurance plan. And really, if you're not on top of it, advocating yeah. for anything you think dealing with some of that right now, you yeah. know, and most people are just afraid or don't know how to deal with that. Yeah. So it's a full-time job, just making sure you have what you need to yeah. exist. And, you know? and it was like, I knew... I needed it. It was like this whole big fight. And like I was ill in so many different ways and it took me so long to get to it. But I was also living in Arkansas when I first tried and it was just what like impossible. Laws? I couldn't get it. I like didn't have the right insurance and like the insurance I could get access to, it wouldn't give me the doctors that would prescribe me it. And if I even got that far, I would have had to already had a therapist that diagnosed me two years prior. Oh, so, so there's a time frame? Yes. And you a have diagnosis to prove that has to... That you've been, quote okay. unquote, trans for longer than two years. Now, is that just in Arkansas? That was Arkansas, but it's each state has different laws around it. I was able to leave Arkansas, move back to Seattle in order to get access because I had a partner in Seattle at the time. So I moved in with her and just spent time working towards, it did it like became a full-time job, just like working towards getting testosterone. And I got intensely lucky. Like I got a good insurance that you had to do some deep research though, because different insurances will not cover gender affirming care. I also chose Washington to move back to because that state requires insurances to provide gender affirming care. Most states don't. Most states, they leave it up to the insurances. So you'd have to research which insurances allow coverage of gender affirming care because they can decide to not cover it. So being a moving artist and exploring life, it's, it's also kind of, yeah, it's <laughs> like, where do I go that supports yeah. me being who I am? You know, like, folks, this is for reals. Imagine yeah. just being. It's our broken who, healthcare system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's very broken. Yeah. Because it's not even like, this is just gender affirming care, but I have a lot of friends that are also on disability. And that's like a whole nother layer of like you are constantly advocating for yourself for this thing that you absolutely need that is your truth. The insurances, the doctors, the government like yes. isn't allowing you access to this necessity. Yeah, or they'll give you some bad generic yes. version of it. Storygram Network. Dan, this is a little side moment for any listeners that are listening. You've done a lot of research. You've done the homework do you have a place like on your website or I saw in your artist talk that you have a lot of research and information you've saved and resources that if kids and young people are going through this, yeah, would they be able to go to your website and see some of these resources? Yeah. Like I want to do something like yeah. that. That's yeah. always been something I've wanted to have like a place you can go to. I've just constantly been moving so yeah. much but I really like that like I will I put know that in up. Sonoma County <laughs> yeah if anyone is 
here. Like I know Positive Images, we work a lot yeah. with up in Santa Rosa. Fantastic nonprofit. You know, we do queer art club yes. here as well, which is, I know you worked with the kids a I while did. ago. Yeah. Just if anyone's listening in Sonoma County, I know that's a super great reference to yeah, go up the positive and, images. and they'll support yeah. you through there. No, I'll put that up. And yeah, then you it, can go it takes on to time. My you're a busy person. So. Yeah, but I got like a whole list. I put it up whenever I do a talk or whatnot. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. That's why it triggered yeah. like, I saw a list yes, <laughs> of definitely. amazing resources. Yeah, because I mean, it's something that I had to do just for myself to get access. And it's a lot of work that you have to do. And even when I moved here, I had then at that point already been on testosterone for over a year. And I moved here and then everything had to change. Like I had to get a new doctor, right. I had to get a new insurance. Here's Oakland, right? Yes, I yeah. moved to mm-hmm. Oakland uh, right before here. And you'd think, you know, California, it's going to be easy, <laughs> simple Not, transition. It's actually... No, it was insane. And it took until... A lot of red tape in California. Yeah, it took me six months to get my prescription again. Wow. Which also like if I... I mean, what's the other route that you'd have to go to? I mean, is there some yeah. type of herbal? I know this sounds stupid. Herbal no, testosterone, yeah, or it, do you cross yeah. the border, so, pick it up over there? What or? I would actually use, which is like one of the moments where I'm like, thank God for technology. Um, I would use this app called Lex, and it's like a queer. I think the original starting of the app was like a queer dating app. Okay, but it pretty much now is just like this constant board where you just post something like in search of whatever housing a partner for me testosterone and so I just posted onto it I was like my prescription is not coming through I'm in desperate need for HRT hormone replacement therapy and I had like 20 people reach out to me and they were like I have extra I have needles like I have syringes and so I was able to kind of rely on my community and was able to get through those six months. But it's also something that like, I was really scared when I moved here because I didn't know about that. Yeah. And then I went on like some like date or something and was like, (laughs) you know, just panicking. I was just like, oh, they're like, how are you? And I was just like, I know you don't know me, but I'm like panicking right now (laughs) about my prescription. Yeah. And they were like, oh, you should just post it on Lex. And I was like, what? (laughs) Guys. Okay. But it's like also, you know, take that with some level of safety. Like I was able to do that here in California and felt okay. But like, there's a lot of risks when you do that. And it's not like a prescription. Like I also had someone who gave me a bottle of testosterone, but it was already open. So it's like, you have to be careful. With these fentanyl days. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't know if you do go that route, just be like really careful and talk to your friends. And like, if you, need people to talk to. Lex was a good resource too for like meeting other queers in the area. But I think it's just so deeply important, the sharing of information because the internet, that is the one thing that's horrifying is (laughs) there's a 50-50 split on the internet when it comes to information about testosterone. Like sometimes I inject and it goes wrong, like I bleed a lot or something. And once when that happened, I freaked out because it's like it it's like a yeah. tiny needle, but then I'm like yeah. bleeding like a fountain. And I'm like, that wow. doesn't seem right. Hit a nerve. Right. And it's just like, you don't know though. Like you, you, once you do get access, they pretty much hand over the needles, the syringes, testosterone. They're like, okay, you go do this at home. So I don't like, they don't it's show all self do it administered. Anything. Yeah. Like that's yeah, risky. Exactly. But you also know, it's like, why would they show a trans person? They're not trying I to get support what you're us. Saying. Yeah. You know, like, Although it doesn't, you know, I mean, come on, everyone. It's like a needle exchange program and how people were against that back in the day. And <laughs> you know? it's just, crazy. If sometimes my prescription, they'll screw me over and not prescribe me the needles. So then I get access to the testosterone, but then I have nothing to inject with. And then I'll try to go into the pharmacy and be like, hey, I'm supposed to pick up these needles. But then it's been this really interesting, depends on what pharmacy, depends who I ask whether or not they'll give me needles. And I'm like, that's just insanity. (laughs) 
because then you're just typing me, you know? And so it was like this big, long, like 10, 15 minute yeah. back and forth. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Ugh, it's yeah. awful. Or my favorite is, oh, we're out. <laughs> so you're and I'm like, now. well, then you order it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, they'll just leave me there. They'll be like, oh, no, we're out. And then I'll just be like, uh, what do I, what do I do with yeah. that? Where else do I go? Yeah. And then I'll just have to go to a different pharmacy, but and yeah, it's, it's always really a pharmacy messy. you have to go to. Yeah. Cause it's a controlled substance yeah. testosterone, which is also fascinating. Right. I just meant like the needles, the needles supposedly you can buy over the counter, but I find that when I have a testosterone prescription, it's harder for me to get access to the needles. <laughs> no rhyme or reason. Big shrug. <laughs> Big shrug. But testosterone is also a controlled substance. So in the state of California, you are only allowed a certain amount over a certain period of time. And it depends on what your doctor prescribes you. So if they don't prescribe you enough, they're shorting you. And so when I first got my prescription here, they were shorting me. And so then I had to find a new doctor so that I could keep my prescription at a full state. Because I would go to the pharmacy and be like, okay, I'm out of tea. And they'd be like, oh, we can't give you any right now. What was their justification of shorting you testosterone? Oh, if I had the answers to these things. Uh, right. You know, it's, it's uh, just like, I know it's sick. Like it really is. In Washington, I had a pharmacist that refused to serve me, which is also something people can do. It's a serious, traumatic. Yeah. And I would imagine going off and on and having to deal with that. Is there side effects that your body yeah. goes through or you go through? I mean, it is a hormone. So right, if you right. think about like but birth control. But if you're going on and off those things, yeah. your body is like going. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's emotionally not okay. Yeah. Again, I've been super lucky with Lex and such yeah. that I have been able to maintain what I started with. Because I also, right when I got on it, it hit me that like, I never want to get off this. Like this has completely changed my life. I've never been more emotionally stable. I had never been fully in my body before until testosterone. And that's something I never want to give that up. Yeah. Like I spent like 25 years of my life being dissociated and now I'm not. And I recognize like what that means that people live like that. They can be connected and it makes life, it made me understand so many other aspects of like happiness, but also the amount of depression that I saw in my childhood and hormones do a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, like they are kind of what regulates us in so many ways. And oh, absolutely. You don't identify with one. That's like a deep set thing. That's not just like a casual endeavor. I can imagine. Yeah. And, you know, I'm on the cisgender middle yeah. age going through my own hormone yeah. situation. Yeah. And it's intense, you know, Absolutely. it's intense. So I yeah. totally understand. Thank God they've come a long way. Absolutely. You know, that you can <laughs> have yeah. access to that Seriously. no matter how hard it is. Yeah. And hey, it's worth it. Yeah. Clay, let's uh, yeah. go back to ceramics. Know, so no, that's okay. I yeah. really appreciate you sharing this story. And I'm hoping people are out there listening can really understand. Yeah. And, but we go back from after Vegas and Montana, you found your first basically clay. Yeah. So through your travels and you're down in Arkansas and stuff, when did it really start to take like, this is the form that I'm working in. Did it go to sculpture first or how was that journey through the ceramics world? Definitely. So in Montana, it's a very pottery centered school. So I got really deep into throwing and I loved it. I was like, I'm going to be a potter. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, this is it. I love making functional things. And then I didn't make art for like two years when I went to Vegas. I know. Soul sucking Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> this is a warning sign, folks. Yes. <laughs> Maybe don't move there. The cesspool of American. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. It's safe to say that, right? Good for it Halloween is, costumes. Yeah, oh, fantastic. Oh, I got yeah. a good one coming up, folks. <laughs> You're ready. And then I was an art history major, so I was writing a lot. So writing's also something that continues through my my work. Beautiful writing. Thank you. And 
side note, and we can loop back to that in, in mm-hmm. October. Where are you going again for writing? It's basically? called Rockland. I think it's Rockland in oh, the right. woods. Uh, it's in Washington. Oh. It's on the peninsula. It's a somewhat, I think it's a little more new of a residency. Like, I don't Is it I don't a school or is it a retreat no, or what is it exactly? It's started by these two artists and they wanted to start a residency. So it's just a bunch of land with little houses on it, tree houses. <laughs> yeah. This is a dream. Yeah. And they <laughs> do fully funded residencies. So, and it's writing residencies. I'm going to write there, okay. but it's a multidisciplinary residency. So they take writers, visual artists, musicians, dancers, wow. and kind What's of create a cohort. Again? Rockland. Rockland. It's yeah. in Washington. Yes. Yeah. R-O-C-K. L-A-N-D. L-A-N-D. Mm-hmm. Okay. Only because the there's a rock. Rockland L-Y-N in California. So I know. And sometimes I drop That's D's okay. and T's. Um, so... <laughs> I get my rock land. (laughs) Yeah, rock land. Spell it out. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I'm I'm excited to what comes out of that. Me too. I feel like you're kind of marrying that into your ceramics work that you're doing. Yeah. I keep going off cuff on the ceramics thing. No, you're good. I mean, I also just identify in a more like multidisciplinary lens, but the clay tends to be the most talked about. So it's like, it's one of those interesting things where I see my art practice in a lot of different ways, but the clay is usually the persistent one. Probably, I think, because it's visual, but it's also open to dialogue. I know when I first saw it, I thought, wow, what is happening here? You know, <laughs> yeah. It's very much, and maybe you can explain just some of the basics of what you're doing now as far as body. And can I just say, this is kind of bizarre, but since you've been here in the past three months, because you kind of work and talk about the body and they're doing sculpture. I've had so many mannequins exchanges. (laughs) It's the most bizarre thing. We had four mannequins donated. We have mannequins going out. I got Juan Marche said, hey, we have mannequins down here at the thrift store. And I've never had such a... So I don't know. Mannequins. I feel like you brought like <laughs> magnet for mannequins. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but you know, your work is clearly in clay, but talk a little bit more. It's just, no, I, I that love was that. Weird that, that is it really kind weird. Of like manifested a lot of these yeah. and they're never really full mannequins. You know? <laughs> yes. So that's, it's really Which interesting Which is also very, me. yeah. Wow. That's very fitting. Uh-huh. Yeah. That is. Yeah. yeah. I uh, make clay about the body and I like to call them amorphous kind of figures. So they go beyond something that is structured because to be amorphous is to be beyond a structure or outside of a structure. And so I think about that with trans bodies, living and experiencing things outside of the structure of society and what we're told is supposed to be a bodily lived experience. So a lot of this work is amorphous bodies, trans bodies, queer bodies. I also think about the word abject, abject bodies. Mm -hmm. So there's something, Julia Kirsteva was this theorist. She talks about the theory of the abject, which is almost like a sensation of meeting something that's grotesque and the feeling of separation from it, as well as you feel that separation because you are connected to it. So I think about society's fear of trans people and also the disgust that I feel from those people towards myself but I know it's because it's coming from a place where they can see themselves in me and they right. don't know what to do with that. So it's like jealousy, per se. I love that, yes. <laughs> They're envious. <laughs> That's typically where a lot of ignorance or not understanding where it comes from. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And I find it fascinating because of these body ports, and I'd like that you described it that way because there will be... <laughs> let's say like a leg or a torso or something like that. And it kind of falls into something else. And it's like this open story, but it's also an open space to bring in, you know, what you make of it. There's no explanation. And I don't think there needs to be. It's quite beautiful. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think everyone will take from it something different because that's just what art does. But yeah, I try to create bodies that feel familiar to everyone because we all have a body, but something where you can meet those conversations at and then hopefully also be able to hold space for heavier conversations. Yeah. It's really important to me. 
It's fantastic. Yes. <laughs> well, I feel like we could talk for hours, but <laughs> and we could, but I just want to remind people again, if you want to take a visual, hop on over to Dan's Oh my gosh. Instagram. I'm blanking. Website. Yeah, Instagram. <laughs> It's also noon, it's lunchtime, oh, so wow. I'm forgetting yeah. how to, to eat. But <laughs> So anyway, yes, take a look at that, but also you will be having your artist talk as well as opening on November 18th. Okay, it's a busy weekend. Yes. It's like comedy one night and then yeah. your amazing show. And then the next day I have a little kids recital. So it's interesting. <laughs> so great. So we do it all here at the Sonoma Community really, Center. We want to wrap and invite all communities, but this is going to be really amazing. And your show will be up for at least a month. And we invite everybody to come and, and check it out. So one little thing <laughs> yes. I want to jump over because when I really first started listening to your story on Kate's radio, it was very music based. And yes. the funniest thing I was on Kate's radio show as well. Well, we picked out the same David Bowie song. <laughs> All you pretty things, right? Oh, yes, uh, God. Uh, <laughs> I love that song. It's so I, good. And, and so Takeshi and I have this David Bowie connection to uh, when he did die, they did a um, David Bowie tribute. Oh, yeah. Show for a couple of years, right? Demetra and right. Ian and all of them. And the first show that they did it right after his death, there was this album they were giving away. I got like a candle and then the album, I didn't have a record player, right? I'm all, mm-hmm. oh my God, I won this album. And it's an obscure one. Takeshi, what's the name of it? It's ours. Ours. And so I gave it to Takeshi, yeah. right? And so ever since, there's always been this like... <laughs> And then I, I hear that music. Yes. I see we're all very inspired by oh, David yeah. Bowie. is everything to me. Yeah. Um, really oh, you pretty is. things. One of my favorite performances is from that BBC recording. When yes. He's playing the piano. Oh, my God. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> totally melt just watching him play that song. And you can just feel the vibe from it. Yeah. I mean, just such a creative, intense force. Did you was. see that newer... Bowie. I did. I did not love it. I didn't get all the way through it. Yeah. I was pretty disappointed. (laughs) I I felt like it had this vibe of, you know, those 60s movies where they disappear the screen. Like it was super, (laughs) I guess my attention span's a little shorter. And I feel like we both come from a little bit more of a punk rocky vibe. Definitely. Where I like to get my facts out, maybe see some glam stuff (laughs) and really freaking (laughs) rock out to the music. and Yeah. Yeah, you know, maybe take it that level, and it was it worked great. Some people loved it. They that, really did. Yeah, you know, but why I felt conflicted with it was they focused so heavily on like the beautiful how multidisciplinary he was and creative he was, and how he was always making. But they never ever talked about any of the like traumas that he went through, right. which were like so pretty vital to yeah. like why he was making so much and the stuff he was making and. Also, just like the times he was making in. So I don't know. It just like that felt weird to be like, oh, we're not going to talk about his like two year stint in Germany where he was trying to like get clean. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the, know, yeah, like, Berlin right. era. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that's, that's a very why, prolific like, era, too. Yeah. And that's why I was like, oh, we're just going to skip over that. Fascinating. Right. Yeah. Right. Just kind of idolize. Yeah. And that happens a lot when people pass on. Yeah. They kind of forget. That they're a, a person. Of, yeah, that they're a person. <laughs> they go through sh- That's why I like books like Motley Crue, The Dirt. That oh, was just yeah. the best opening. Yes. <laughs> anyway, yes. it's a little grittier. There's this documentary about uh, David Bowie when he first moved to America. And it, they just, it was just the cameraman and David Bowie. Yes. And he goes really? from like New York yep. to California in this like, I think it's a Buick or something. I yeah. can't remember. But at the time, he was only eating peppers and drinking milk. Yeah, it was called the white diet. Yeah. He did so much coke and drank so a lot of milk. Gross. Is that his white duke? Day? No, no, this no, is weirdly really enough. White duke. Yeah, he, but he was duke. he was all but 90 pounds. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. yeah. And it was oh, it was during the uh the low era and it Since was the just Iggy Pop club, It was right before the, he had to go get clean. Yeah. It, yeah, and he was so far gone but it's the most fascinating documentary ever because just hearing him talk about music and just philosophies yeah about life during that time is just so crazy and it's worth every minute 
Well, do you know the name of it? No, you can okay. just find it on YouTube. Okay. <laughs> Great. And I feel like the BBC documentary that's on YouTube, the like long one, mm-hmm. I think it's like an hour long or something. Yeah. It's pretty good. There's also some other documentaries where they interview everybody except for him. <laughs> yes. <It's>, wait, <laughs> what? But also, I he do think alive. those were like pretty hilarious because there's like, when they interview his bandmates, I do think it's really telling. You know, like he was an intense guy. Yeah. yeah. He's like quit the spiders or at yes! City Stardust. Just they didn't, all of a sudden didn't tell his band yeah. that he was not going to be Ziggy anymore. Yeah, yeah. And then in the concert was like, this is the last time I'll be playing as Ziggy Stardust. And all his bandmates were like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> like, yeah. That what is were you so going to tell I mean, us? That's intense to be around people like that, yeah. that just change on a dime. Yeah. But also forgetting to tell, Hey, Oh, by the way, we're all moving on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for real. So I feel like yeah. that happens a lot with theater i mean he's definitely the, the yes you know. yeah he's more theater i would say theater yeah. whatever all of it's really good but he's an amazing musician yes. too a lot of the musicians that would do the tribute band were talented in their own right and had some of those songs were really complicated oh yeah yeah, yeah. i so, listened to that bass player during the stardust era and it's yes. so right. complicated yeah but also <laughs> that album is everything oh <laughs> that was the album for me where Same. i was like I, I had like compilations and i had earthling and outside and they were good but you have to listen to bowie with a full album listen you can't Absolutely. just have like In the greatest order, hits. yeah like because it's oh, a story look, we have some purists here yeah folks. you have to <laughs> you, you can listen to bowie however you want listening to ziggy stardust i was like this is amazing. Yes. And then I had to like buy every single one of the, his albums right after that. Yeah. One by one when there were CDs. But I mean, the Ziggy <laughs> album, that like, that has been in my life for so long through every rough thing. Oh, yeah. Because like that story is everything. It's the biggest love letter to rock and roll yes, in the whole right. entire world. Yeah. I love it so much. It's so I'm good. Back. You gotta go oh, back. Yeah. All right, Molly. Go yeah. Back. Oh, you gotta, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's so amazing. And that one though, I will say like each song is beautiful, but if you do listen to it all the way through as the story unfolds, it's a masterpiece. Oh yeah, definitely. It is. Yes. All right. I'm back. I'm back. I'm doing my homework. <laughs> Doing yes. my homework. Yeah, I mean, I mean, not that I don't love it, but that's really a good perspective. Yeah, I'll always be stuck like in a, that era. Like a novel. Yes, yes rock and roll it novel. really is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, that ends up, like rock and roll suicide will oh, always yeah. make me cry. <laughs> oh, it's so <laughs> good. Yeah. Yes. I love that era specifically, but I do respect the other ones. <laughs> yes, I feel you. Yeah. And when some people say, oh, yeah, I like his Eno era. It's like, no, no. you really don't. <laughs> don't lie to me. Don't try That's to be obscure. Like the to of the <laughs> I, I, I'm with you on that same era. It's yeah. Truly what I love. Yeah. Listening to his work when he died as well. Like oh, that song was yeah. haunting. Yes. He did a co- piece of choreography to that. Yeah. And it was. His last wow. album was, he did. Yeah. It is haunting. It's haunting. It's yeah. very haunting. And then they released a single right after where yeah. he's like up in the heavens looking yeah. down yeah. at us. Oh my gosh, like, there's like the it's whole modern, yeah. it's yeah. exactly how I would imagine the video would be too. When You know, when you mm-hmm. see something, you're like, whoa, that's yeah, kind of how I imagine that would yeah. be. You it, know? Yeah. I think it was like a rocket shooting up and there are, everybody's watching it from the television. Yes. And yeah, he's like talking about how he could see us from down up where he is. It was just like, oh, this is so chilly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, God. I love it. You know, as well as I know, Oakland, when you move down there, it says a small little side story, but bringing it back to the Sonoma Community Center. But early 90s, I lived here. Primus played here and as well as Green Day right before Green right. Day blew up. <laughs> yeah. And there's actually a really good YouTube documentary on all of the early East Bay pre-punk rock Green Day, but they were more penal about the whole era and really based. It's so good. It's so good. Yeah. Okay. I have a story about Green Day, which yes. is pretty funny. I do too. So <laughs> when personal, they, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But when they signed to Warner Brothers, right, yeah. they had this one last show or kind of like a tour of the smaller places and they played at the Phoenix. People yeah. were picketing in front of the Phoenix theater, right? And guess who it was? It was Rancid. That's hilarious. 
<laughs> well, I'll tell you what, when Green Day came up here, that was like the whole era. There was like no effects, bad religion. And then the other side of the the spectrum was Green Day. And of course, like all the more hardcore people thought, oh God, you know, it's like pop punk and all the girls loved them. But when they played up here, they actually used to dress up in women's clothes. Like Trey showed yeah. up and had a top. He had the bottoms and I had the top because they came, we... We lived wow. outside in Shellville, so they came to our house afterwards and, you know, cavorted parties, blah, 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 blah. More stories out of that, but that's off the mic. Right. <laughs> and right. not my story to really tell. That was amazing. You know, what a fun free time. What yeah. a fun free time and happy that, like, Community Center was kind of a part of that. Yeah. We had Primus when they blew up and... First, nobody was coming, but then people were trying to get in through the windows in Andrew's <laughs> Hall. Yeah. My God. Yeah. Everybody's got a perspective on it, though, in this town. So, but it's fun. I, I love, love all these like gritty, I still love shows. Yeah. Like Oakland has a ton of like electronic music shows that are just completely underground. Yeah. You know, or renegades or whatever you want to call them. <laughs> um, but they have like monthlies in just different areas. I am. Um, I teach at the Berkeley Potter Studio. Oh, why? Nice. And right across the street is one of those. I like never remember what it's called because it's just the address and numbers in my brain doesn't happen. I do not remember the order of numbers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was like one of Green Days. Like they, they Gilman started, Street. Yeah, oh, Gilman, yeah Street. Gilman. Yeah, so that's yeah. what this um, documentary is all about. Yeah. Gilman Street. How Gilman Street started it how they chased off like the SF punks and how they got in the whole idea. It was supposed to be was run by the people for the people, this community right. where anybody could come. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I saw Nirvana there and I mean, they they're had just still started, playing great shows. Exactly. So that, they're still that, up and that running. That warms my heart because yeah. you could go to the Gilman street, no matter yeah. what age you were. Yes. Whatever. It's still like yeah. that. I love that. Like I, love that. I will like be like walking to work and just see like every age of punk still yeah. like coming in and out of that place. <laughs> and I'm like, it. wow, that's really special. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had didn't know no it was still idea. Going. Well, I had no I th- idea I what the place either. was because it's a canning shop. It says canning yeah. shop. But I was like, it's clearly like a punk venue because like you get all to the do your posters. I know. Gilman yeah. Street because it tells the whole story. I will mm-hmm. have to go watch that. Yeah. But I like the continuation of it because it drops off at a certain point. Oh. Like, hmm, I wonder if the Gilman's still around. Yeah. It's um, still kicking it. Yeah. That's awesome. What are you listening to these days? Oh, goodness. Well, lately I've been listening to my like nostalgic album, which is also just cringe, but uh, <laughs> I used to listen to and still do My Chemical Romance. I heard you mention that. And I have a deep love for the Black Parade album. I thought you were going to say like Katy Perry. No. Or something. <laughs> no. That Whatever. would have really Come thrown. up to pre-ballet. Yeah. I, I love the last Harry Styles song, so speak for yourself. <laughs> I'm all over the board. But yeah. I did listen to that, and I thought, that is really good. Like, I didn't give enough cred to the chemical room. That's I mean, one band I never, one. yeah, I've never given him a deep dive before. But we're and like, all- they're an energy. Uh, that album, I really love, though. I think I just really like albums that are very theatrical, like the David Bowie. Yeah. yeah. Ziggy Stardust. You but can't go wrong with glam, in my opinion. I know. Yeah. yeah. I just, I've always been a sucker for that. But yeah, uh, glam rock holds a really deep, uh, <laughs> deep place for me. But anyways, yeah. My Chemical Romance, the Black Parade album, is just like a really fun album, I guess. It's just has a really good, if you listen through it, to it in order all the way through, I just got this like really, it could be like one long song almost. Okay. Like it has all these ups and downs and like not so much tells a story, but like sound wise, it feels like a whole theatrical I like, event. I like a soundscape like that. Yes, you soundscape. Know? You yeah. get to go on that journey. There's definitely some albums like that. Like I've experienced yeah. that in Radiohead and mm-hmm. there's just certain, you're all this whole we were just talking about that, you know, the whole album makes sense really. Yes. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and like me and my friends, like in middle school, like me and Hugo would like listen to that and just be like at his house, like screaming the lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I think there's something I associate that album with like some like really beautiful, like trans moments from like my childhood. And so it's like always a weird one that comes up when I'm like making 
art, I'll just like put on that album because I'm like, oh, that's like a good... Feels true. Yeah. 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 Even though it's just like funny because like I'll take my headphones off and it's just like blasting through the headphones and someone will be trying to talk to me. <laughs> and it's just like, you know, this guy like screaming. That's awesome. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's casual. <laughs> we got, right, you know, we got to set our mode. Yeah. I, and I also, I, I we'll probably have to wrap it up here pretty darn soon. I hope we yeah, don't have yeah. to cut it. Maybe we had to do a two-parter. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But we could. I feel like at your artist talk, you had this visual of a picture when you had moved here of the citrus tree. And yeah. I kind of feel you're going through this, a sense of joy right now, yeah. or just kind of a, a peaceful joy being here, which is really feels good and like, on behalf like of the community center, but me as well. It, it feels good to see people manifesting their work and being joyful in it, you know, yeah, right now. Definitely. I like feel like since moving to the Bay, which was only last January, really, uh, like Christmas time is when I moved here. It was just like completely transformed my life. Like I had never lived somewhere like this where it's just... It was just you feel like it's a, a good community. Yeah. And like you. right away, I Hold felt like up. I felt like it was also just like time, you know, like I think not everyone will probably feel that in the Bay, but I feel like I came here and it was like the first time I just like moved here, not because of an opportunity, not because of a partner. It was just like, I need to move somewhere and like, it needs to be like purely my own reasoning. And I like came and visited some friends in San Leandro for Christmas. And then I was like, this is the spot, like this is the place. And then I, I got a job as a barista and like right away became like best friends with that crew. And they're still my best friends. And like, right. it's just, it happened so fast where it's just, I was held by the people. i never felt home like that. Yeah. Oakland's very vibing. Yeah. You definitely feel it when you're over there. Yeah. And it was like so quickly, really special. But the big one, which was the citrus trees, was I've just, I'd never lived somewhere where citrus is just like <laughs> happening. Correct. And I know we're nothing compared to Southern California, <laughs> but a much more better vibe. It's yes. kind of amazing. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you take it for granted out here. And it's like um, winter. <laughs> right. I was it like, is. this I is got supposed to be like the my dark window. days. And like it's <laughs> sunny. There's oranges, like oranges, lemons, lemons yeah. like there's things flowering. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> this is January. I was like, okay, I can't leave. <laughs> you probably laughed at us after when you got here and we're like, oh God, this is the rainiest year we've ever had. <laughs> I was like, okay, I can handle that. <laughs> that was pretty doable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Bay feels like home. So Great. I'm going to try to stick around. Cool. Yeah. Good. Well, your joy to have up here. Can't wait to see your show on November 17th. Any 18th. last God. <laughs> Folks, that weekend okay. is huge. You're, okay. you're coming Just to come Sonoma. Through. Yeah. yeah the exactly. whole weekend. Yeah. The whole weekend you're gonna spend here. You're gonna see a comedy show <laughs> that will be on the seventeenth. You're gonna go to Dan's show on the eighteenth. Yep, yep. And full weekend. Full weekend. And then you, if you want to round it out for a little kid's ballet recital, <laughs> we'll see you on the 19th. But that just goes to show that we do everything here at the community center and we welcome all with open arms to come and make art, do art, support artists and represent, find your community and creativity. All right, let's go eat some lunch. Yes, sounds good. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. <laughs> <laughs>